What's the most difficult animal to intubate? What are the major concerns when anesthetizing a giraffe? How does someone even become a veterinary anesthesiologist? My name is Max Feinstein and I'm a human anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And in this video, I sit down and talk with Dr. Margaret Weipart, veterinary anesthesiologist at Surgipet Surgery and Anesthesia Center in San Marcos, California, to answer these and many more questions. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribe to the channel. Let's dive in. My name is Margaret Weipart, and I'm an anesthesiologist, but anesthesiologist for animals as opposed to um, anesthesiologist here who's for humans. I was born, raised, and educated in Poland, and then uh, for my residency, which I did at UPenn, uh, I moved to the US, to Philadelphia, and uh, following residency, I've been working in private practice as a veterinary anesthesiologist. In terms of residency, to be totally clear, you're talking about veterinary medicine residency. Absolutely. So UPenn, vet school, um, and that's residency in anesthesiology um, for veterinarians, yes. How long is anesthesia residency? Uh, for? Three years. Three years, and then they have a board exam. Before I came here, mm -hmm. I asked my subscribers on YouTube mm -hmm. and the people who follow me on Instagram to weigh in with questions uh -huh. that they would like to ask a veterinary okay. anesthesiologist. We got a lot of responses, uh -huh. so I did have to be a bit selective with this, but let's go ahead and do a rapid fire okay. question right. and answer session. Let's see, I hope I know the answers. Okay. Are some species more resistant or have higher metabolic demands and need higher doses of anesthetic agents as compared to other species? Uh, so definitely the smaller they are, the higher the metabolic rate. So if you look at, you know, um, mouse, rat, the really small pocket animals, they tend to need higher doses. And then generally speaking, all like domestic animals like dogs and cats will have a higher requirements than people. And then how about the even bigger animals, horses, uh, you typically, so, so this is where the size uh, comes in play. Everything should be sort of, um, you know, uh, dosed per square meter, so like surface area. So as they get bigger, the doses actually get smaller. Um, so not necessarily. With horses, with sedation, for example, because of the behavior, which is, you know, fear of flight response, so like they tend to be very acute in the responses, you tend to sedate them more, and so use a lot of higher doses. But generally speaking, I would just say that um, the smaller the species of the uh, animal, the higher the doses it requires. Hmm. What species is generally considered to have the most challenging airway to secure? I would say pigs. Pigs? Correct. Not a uh, giraffe. Uh, not really. Uh, pigs, um, rabbits, and guinea pigs. What makes their airways difficult? So guinea pigs, they have a really small mouth opening. So you really can't see anything. And then you can't use a fiberoscope or anything because it's so tiny. Rabbits are very reactive and again, extremely difficult. It's a long mouth, really difficult to have any visualization. Um, and then pigs, it's, it's, they are like large, you know, uh, normal sized pigs. That's a very difficult airway, a lot of a redundant tissue. I think it's very similar to, you know, very difficult airway in a human being. Um, so those are the most challenging ones. Now, are there the other wild animals that are way more difficult? Yes, but again, this is kind of more talking about the, you know, my scope of practice. That's what I would say of the most, uh, most difficult. Giraffe, you can like, yes, the mouth opening is really small, but you can sort of, it's big enough that you can, um, by palpation, actually kind of find your way. How big of an endotracheal tube do you have to use to uh, not that big. a giraffe? Yeah, it's typically between 24 to 26 millimeters. So not as big, they relatively to their size, they have actually a pretty small airway. Wow. And I think this is to compensate because otherwise the trachea would um, be a huge dead space. So I think to compensate for that huge neck that's a dead space, that's probably why they have a fairly small uh, airway. I have heard that you have to worry about cerebral perfusion pressure if you anesthetize a giraffe and then lay them down. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> well, uh, yes and no. So yes, the, the, there's a whole conversation about the pressures in a giraffe. Generally speaking, what we are always worried about is like, what is the normal pressure for the giraffe to be under anesthesia? Because normally when you measure that, it's super high. It could be, you know, a, a, it's about, um, you know, 200 at the head level and 250 at the heart level could be even higher. Wow. Um, and it's like kind of them being normal and standing. So things can like, depending head down or head up, like if you look at those studies, those are crazy numbers. Um, but what we really worry about in the giraffe is, is that neck that it's so long and acts as a lever with a really heavy head at the end. And so when you anesthetize them, when they, what we call, you know, when they go down, this is the most critical part. And also when they get up, because it's really hard for them to do that when they are not fully awake. Um, those are the challenges, not like 
not necessarily the, the perfusion pressure. But yes, we always worry because we are not sure, like, there's not that many giraffes to be anesthetized to like, get the study and figure out what's the proper blood pressure. I think in the giraffe it works very differently. Um, but it's true, like when, they, when their um, head is down, the blood pressure may be at the head 350, and when they go all the way up, both at the heart and the head level, the blood pressure for like about 30 seconds drops to 60. It's crazy. And then it just like, poof, normalizes. So I think they're also like used to the huge swings. Like yeah. It must be why they, they are doing okay with that. Um, but at the, the, the differences are scary. It sounds terrifying, yeah, to be exactly. honest. Yeah, exactly. I know. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I think it's probably fairly obvious, but what is your favorite species to work with? Um, I think dogs. Yeah, definitely. Also, I, I've, um, I've used to really love equine, like a horse anesthesia. It's very challenging um, and it's also a little bit physical because obviously everything you do is in huge volume and huge amounts. So uh, it's a very physical work and they're very challenging to recover correctly. So when you get it right, it's such a good feeling. Is it true that goats are not excellent candidates for general anesthesia? And if so, why is that? Absolutely not. Um, there are you know, um, certain characteristics that are ruminants. So they have a huge rumen um, and rumen being their, you know, primary largest stomach. So if they tend to have problem with, you know, regurg, so like so-called vomiting, so kind of like the fluid starts when, when you anesthetize and the fluid starts coming out of the rumen, it's a huge amount of, of fluid and it is a huge volume and obviously can cause aspiration pneumonia. Um, but because like, as I always say in anesthesiology, as, lo as long as I know what I'm expecting to happen, I can prepare myself for that complication and I can do a lot of things to prevent that from happening to begin with. Because I don't know how you look at that, but as an anesthesiologist, I, the only complications I, I don't really like are the unexpected ones. So for me, goat, I actually very, I very much like goats. Um, they were fairly easy typically to um, anesthetize and again if you know you have sections you properly position them properly give them medications some are better than the others and then you take care of your airway to secure it it's typically and then you this is where you kind of sometimes want to recover them in a correct way too to prevent that from happening it's typically I don't think it's a big problem are there sub specializations for veterinary anesthesia I know well, most of us after um, board exam and, and becoming boarded we do you know, select certain species. So some people tend to do more zoo medicine. Um, some anesthesiologists will choose large animals, especially equine. That's a pretty equine anesthesia. That's a pretty um, you know large field. Um, some will do what we call small animals. So essentially um, dogs and cats. Uh, some will do more of an exotic but still domesticated species. So that's what include you know small mammals, rabbits, mouse, rats, um, birds. Uh, so this sort of pocket animals. There are still some that obviously will do all of that, especially in the academia. Um, you know, when you're in university, you, you just move between small and large animal hospital doing all these things. But most, most of us in private practice tend to you know, limit us, um, the scope of our practice. Um, but there's no actual specialty. How much exposure to anesthesiology do uh, students get during their general veterinary education? Not that much, honestly. Um, they definitely um, have some labs when they have to, you know, personally anesthetize pets. They definitely go through the so-called anesthesia rotation and they obviously have, um, you know, lectures. So there's definitely a two weeks when they are in the anesthesia department um, getting exposed to the anesthesia. Do you have a sense of how many veterinary anesthesiologists are boarded in the United States? It's about 100 um, total. Wow. that are in the private practice and then probably about I would say 50 60 that are in the university so we are a pretty small group if somebody is thinking about having their pet go to the veterinarian for surgery mm -hmm. what sort of decision tree do they go down in terms of thinking about whether they would like to involve the services of a veterinary anesthesiologist with anesthesia it's always about safety so um, we do we do tend to provide anesthesia the safest way possible. So anyone who, regardless of their condition of their pets, just want the safest way, that is definitely, you know, seeking out the anesthesiologist is, um, is the way to go about that. Not to say that, you know, other practitioners cannot do this safely, but we're talking about the safest way. Um, and then if the pet has any, you know, pre-existing conditions or has any condition that are, you know, increasing the risk of the anesthesia, if they're older, if there is a concern that something might happen, you know, if they're anesthetized in the general practice, then definitely seeking out an anesthesiologist for consultation, getting, getting opinion and, and getting, you know, just weighting benefits and risks is the way to go. 
I've heard some people say that they have taken their dog to the veterinarian to be assessed for some type of surgery and they've been told that their dog is too old. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like that is an absolute contraindication for any specific type of surgery? Yeah, I think we went, we went away from saying that, uh, you know, age is a disease. It's definitely comes with certain limitations. It is probably for this practitioners with the staff available, equipment available, medications available, it is definitely the dog that they don't feel comfortable anesthetizing. And I'm very glad they say that, because uh, this is absolutely true. Now, is it gonna be the same for me when I evaluate this patient? Probably not. I would say that very rarely we have true clinical indications to say, you know what, just looking at the benefits and risks, we probably don't want to anesthetize your pet. But 99% of the situations like this, when I see the patient, when I consult the patient, when we do additional diagnostics, you know, hard work of things like that, it ends up being, hey, we can actually safely do that. Switching gears a little bit, mm -hmm. you have had some experience with human anesthesiology, is correct. that correct? Can you tell me about how much time you've spent rotating through human anesthesiology? Um, I don't know if I remember now because this was uh, during my residency. Um, I have two or three separate rotations. I think each of them was about two weeks. Um, so probably maybe between five to six weeks total. To what extent do you feel like there's crossover between human and veterinary anesthesiology? Oh, I think it's a huge crossover. You obviously look at your patient and you look at them differently because you have a verbal communication. But you can totally then reapply that. On our end, we are really good at nonverbal communication patients, you know, like that's all we do. And so crossover toward pediatrics, for example, and approach to parents and things like that, I think you could benefit from our experience too. There's a lot of um, conditions where, um, where they are very similar between humans and animals. Um, and so you could, you know, trying to research a way to treat something better, it would be good to, you know, combine um, the knowledge on both sides and, and, um, and then potentially help both. Um, so yeah, there's a huge crossover. Just from start to finish, if somebody who's in the United States mm -hmm. is in high school, mm -hmm. they want to become a veterinary mm -hmm. anesthesiologist, what does that path look like? Okay, so most of the time when you're in a high school, what you need to look for is what sort of courses and classes I'm taking. Are those the ones that are then required for the vet school? The other thing that the vet schools really look for is someone to say, hey, I do have experience in the field. No, obviously not as a doctor, but someone who's helping, whether at the, um, at the zoo, whether helping at the rescue, whether helping at the vet clinic, mostly so that people also understand what comes with the, with the field. You know, we just try to make sure that someone who goes to the vet school understands that there is more parts to this than just, um, you know, great cute animals and, and, you know, lots of fun. When you apply to the vet school, there are two parts to it, obviously your grades and, and, and your GRE and, and things like that, but also there's an interview. It's a very important part of the recruitation. And that interview is all about, hey, are you ready to become a veterinarian? More from a perspective of having experience of that. Does the interview also include spending any time with animals? No. Um, not that I know of. You know, I, maybe some of the schools now set it up, but I don't think so. But it's an interview essentially evaluating candidate. Um, and then, you know, it's about four years of the vet school. I think some schools now have this like shortened program, which is like 3.5 years. Um, and after four years, you have to go out and do an internship which needs to be a um, kind of like a specialty internship. So you're going for different departments, definitely not anesthesia related. It's more of an, hey, we made to make sure that when you, after you became a doctor, you are still a clinician. So you are exposed to different cases and you have an idea about the internal medicine and surgery and oncology, because obviously then it all comes back when you have to you know, anesthetize your patient. So after that general internship, um, that's when you can apply for the anesthesia residency, which is then three years. When you finish, um, write your paper. That's uh, publication is a uh, necessity uh, in order to sit the boards, and then you sit the boards, uh, and that's how you become an anesthesiologist. If somebody is interested in coming here, either they're already in Southern California or they would like to travel to Southern California mm -hmm. to have their their pet evaluated for surgery here, how do they find you? So the easiest way is always you know internet. So they can go to the website. Um, it's surgipet.com. Um, there's an information there, you can fill in the uh, contact form, you can email us, you can call our um, care coordinator, there's a patient care coordinator that can take care of that. From there, you know, we can guide um, someone through the whole process because obviously this is a sort of a referred case, so we would like still to talk to the primary doctor, find out medical records, you know, what's the reason for the surgery, make sure that we are able to provide that care and we are able to most importantly that we also able to provide the post-operative care. 
What species do you care for here? Uh, dogs and cats. That would be my limit, yes. Thank you so much for your Most time. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come into your practice <laughs> and see how you do veterinary anesthesia. This has been so fascinating. All right, not a problem. If you enjoyed this interview, be sure to check out this video where Dr. Weipart lets me film a dog surgery from start to finish and narrates every part of the anesthetic plan. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.